All right, well, why don't I take that on? I'm Tim Cameron, and I represent the buy side of the asset management group for the uh, securities industry and financial services. Can you speak right into the name? Uh, yes, I'm not, I'm not sure it's on, but uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, in the spirit of uh, debate and argument. Uh, I think one of the things I would add to that, Eric, is, is that um, there are two sides to the equation here. For, for every situation where there was a um, borrower who was underwater on their loan, there's been somebody on the other side of that, and our financial markets have grown to a point where there's been a tremendous, here before, prior to the crisis in 08, there's been a tremendous amount of liquidity and, and uh, funding provided for housing, which, which led to a tremendous amount of growth in, in our economy, right? And so, so the other side of that is that you have private investors, and these private investors are, are investors in 401k plans, there are unions, there are foundations, universities, colleges, and individual savings for their own retirement or pay for the kids' education and things of that nature. So the other side is that to the extent that someone is underwater to investors in this, this and, and I think everybody has a sort of misnomer that, that investors on the buy side represent Wall Street. That, they couldn't be further from the truth. And, and I think that it aggravates the buy side members to the extent that they're painted in a brush to say they're Wall Street. They're not. They're up in Des Moines, Iowa, they're in California, they're in North Carolina, South Carolina, wherever it may be. And they represent individual savers in this country. And the savers have been the ones to help provide, in addition to the bank funding, excess liquidity, a place where they could invest capital with the expectation of a rate of return, and those individuals are part of this equation as well. So I just want to make aware from the get-go. As I say, the floor was open to add to that remark, and, and you just reminded me, Tim, and forgive me, audience, I do need to introduce the members of the panel. You can, you can find more information on them here, you may have seen it in your emails, but I'll just quickly introduce Robert Dorfman, sitting to uh, Tim's right, and Tim Cameron, both of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, uh, Neil Richardson, a Senior Economic Analyst at Bloomberg Government, uh, Lori Goodman of Amherst um, Securities, pardon me, Lori. Uh, Bob Hackett, who's a professor at uh, Cornell Law School. Uh, Julia Gordon, who is the Director of Housing Finance and Policy at the Center for American Progress. And right here to my right, Tom George of the American Securitization Forum. He's an executive director there. Uh, just to familiarize you with the members of the panel. Again, pardon me for not introducing them before. Uh, Lori, go ahead. Can I add, can I add something that. Um let me add on to something that, um, that Tim said. I think, you know, if you're looking for numbers, let me give you some numbers. I'm basically a numbers person. It's important to realize that this program, as it's structured, is targeted only at private label investors. So the question is, why is the program targeted only at private label investors? And the answer is because there is nobody who has any obligation to challenge the fair market value. We've reviewed documents extensively. The trustee does not have the obligation to challenge the fair market value assessment. And the servicer has the obligation to, if the money comes in, to make sure it gets to the right place. But there's no obligation to challenge there either. So there's no one who's going to challenge a fair market value estimate um, ar arising from the execution of eminent domain. So the question is, how many loans are actually affected? Are you impacting a big section of the market? And the answer is no. Let me actually give you the numbers. So in San Bernardino County, which we all agree is ground zero for this, there are 19,000 mortgages in private label securities, owner-occupied, greater than 110 LTV, and current, or 4.7% of total San Bernardino mortgages. For the entire state of California, the number is 3.4%. Since, um, since Chicago was also considering it, we did the same analysis for um, Cook County, Illinois. The number was 2%. For the entire state of Illinois, there, it, there's 1.67% of the mortgages are affected. So you're targeting a very, very specific group. And the reason for that target is that this group basically has no protection. Um, Bob, I'd like, I'd like to get to you in just one second, if I may, but before we do that, there... I, I was just going to say, I, I, I think you're talking about the MRP proposal, one of the proposals, but there are actually several, I know of at least three um, groups that are considering something like this, and um, 
and, and they're different proposals. I, I, if, if I may interrupt, I, I think that the point that you were going to raise, Lori, uh, does get to the practicality of the solution on the merits. So before we yeah. get deeper into that debate, I wanted to ask Julia, if I may, and I will come to you right after this, Bob, to just explain why, as Lori pointed out, San Bernardino is kind of ground zero for this debate. From a public policy standpoint, from the effect on a city's tax base, economic viability, could you just give us a bit of an explainer as to why we have gotten to the point where eminent domain is being considered? Right, That's, I'd like to uh, widen the frame a little bit before we start getting into the specific details of any of this. Um, one of the results of the financial crisis um, and the uh, you know, running the housing market into the ditch as we did um, was an enormous loss of home equity by American homeowners. Um, you know, trillions of dollars of home equity were lost. Many people who had quite a lot of equity ended up with a very small amount of equity. You don't hear that much about those people because they're not, quote, underwater, uh, which is where we spend a lot of our time talking. But basically, of the losses that were incurred as a result of the irresponsibility of the financial system, homeowners have basically paid the price. The American people have pa paid the price which is what's reflected in the subsequent economic position and consumer behavior of many of these people. Um, in terms of specifically underwater homeowners, as I think most people know at this point, close to a quarter of all homeowners with mortgages owe more on their mortgage than their home is actually worth right now. Um, that has two different kinds of consequences that are important to us here. One is an increased risk that that loan will default and will eventually be foreclosed upon. Um, that may happen for one of two reasons. One is what we often call life events, death, divorce, disability, the need to relocate for a job. Um, there are a lot of reasons that, or, you know, reduced income at any point. There are many reasons that along the road of home ownership, homeowners run into various challenges. And when homeowners have equity in their home, frequently not only are they able to overcome those challenges without losing their home, but in fact their home provides them with the cushion to overcome those challenges. Uh, in many cases, maybe you can borrow against your home, or if you have to, you can sell your home uh, if, if you're in that level of distress. One of the things we saw in this most recent economic downturn, which is different from previous recessions where unemployment levels were at the levels that we've seen in this recession, um, is that the confluence of negative equity and unemployment caused the crisis, uh, you know, ca caused a lot of these foreclosures to happen. <coughs> it wasn't just unemployment alone. Previously, you would see unemployment spike you would see delinquencies go up, but the rate of foreclosures remained relatively flat. But when, when you combine this negative equity and the unemployment, that's when we kind of ran into the wall. Um, so, you know, certainly foreclosures are a problem from that end. Also, when people have negative equity, um, there may not be as much of an incentive for them to pay their mortgage. And then, then we get into the area that you've heard of called strategic default, where someone decides, you know what, I'm just a glorified renter, except when stuff breaks, I have to fix it. So I'm just going to leave, and I'm going to go down the street where I can be in basically the same house for half the price. So, you know, there are those two uh, types of behaviors or situations that might lead to foreclosures. Now, concentrated foreclosures in a neighborhood are very bad for the neighborhood. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I just want to say there's another area that we don't talk about as often in this crowd, um, but the debt overhang also reduces consumer spending and consumer confidence. And that is obviously a big factor in getting us out of the economic doldrums that we're in. Um, when people feel that they are underwater in their home, even if they don't wish to exit that home and even if they intend to keep on paying their mortgage, they feel like any extra money they have needs to go to pay down that mortgage. And they don't feel like they have anything to count on, they don't have a nest egg. 
And that changes their overall economic behavior, which is bad for all of us. Back to the foreclosures, of course, uh, foreclosures, vacant homes, um, you know, people leaving a neighborhood does create a vicious cycle. Uh, foreclosures and delinquency reduce the values of neighborhood, neighboring properties. Um, if those people get in trouble, now their home is worth even less than it was. Uh, it increases uh, municipalities' costs for police, fire, you know, uh, other kind of public health. Um, and it, it changes the nature of the neighborhood. You know, it has an impact on schools, it has an impact on family stability. So all of these things are the problems that for the past six years we have talked about different ways to address. And you're looking at me like I'm going on too long. Well, I do, I, you know, I do, just because yeah. I, in the interest of time, the seven panelists. I just wanted, I just wanted to is, set a framework. No, 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 and, and that's very valuable. Uh, and uh, so, I, if, if I may, I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. Um, would you move it to uh, Bob, because Bob, I think, to help establish the framework for this debate, uh, it, it helped to set the table a little bit. But really, we're talking about a proposal. We're, we're talking about a proposal. In specifics, and we're talking about a proposal in generalities of using eminent domain, much of the work that has been done uh, is founded on your ideas, as I understand it. You are an active uh, consultant in, in this process. Um, so as briefly as you can, in, as simple, in, in terms as simple as you can find, please explain to this audience how eminent domain would be employed for the purposes of principal deduction. So I was going to give you a few numbers, but I take it you don't. Well, like I say, um, our, our time is limited, and I think that that's work that our audience can do on their own if they, if they want to pursue it at this point. Okay, so, so, so the, sort of the working theory that uh, I sort of made my original proposals on the basis of, and I think a lot of other people did as well, uh, and the theory that I, under, I understand a number of current proposals to sort of be working on the basis of, is that there is one significant kind of market failure out there that is preventing right, certain mortgage loan holders from doing what is not only in the interest of the homeowners and their communities, but in the interest of the lenders, the bondholders themselves. And that is to write down principal on loans whose expected values can be increased by writing down principal. Right? <laughs> uh, now, Lori's done terrific work showing how uh, uh, principal write downs can actually increase uh, 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 expected value on particular loans. Uh, and she's also shown uh, that certain portfolio loan holders, in consequence, are often engaging uh, in principal reduction. That raises a question as to why private label securitized mortgage loans aren't written down at the same rates, or anything near at the same rates, uh, as portfolio loans are. The answer to that question appears to be a number of significant market failures, most of which take the form of contract rigidities, rigidities that you find in the agreements, the so-called pooling and servicing agreements, pursuant to which many mortgage loans were securitized during the heady bubble years when people don't seem to have anticipated a calamitous collapse of housing prices nationwide. And those uh, uh, agreements, in consequence, often did not provide for ready write-down of principal on such <laughs> mortgage loans for ready sale of such loans when such sales would indeed be in the interest of the bondholders in the securitized mortgage trusts themselves. So in the face of rigidities of that kind, the question is how is it, well the question is, is there some way to get past those rigidities to allow for principal write downs that again could be in the interest of bondholders themselves in addition to homeowners and in addition to the communities of those homeowners. And that's the sole significance actually of the use of eminent domain in a context like this, at least as I've articulated the idea and as I understand those who are taking up the idea to be rationalizing or justifying their own proposals. The idea is you simply get past that particular contract rigidity, that particular form of market failure, in order to enable these mortgage loans to be written down.